I retire from the Howard League for Penal Reform on Friday, so this is my last speech, and it's to women! <laughs> Uh, it's absolutely wonderful. I'm so honoured to be here. I'm from a wave of feminists. I don't know which wave it was, but there were lots of waves, and who, who didn't believe in equality. We want to do things differently. I don't want to help with the mess that men have made for the last few thousand years. I want to do things differently. So that's what I'm going to present to you, is doing things differently. And what I've tried to do at the Howard League is, is support and work with women who end up in conflict with the criminal justice system and to, do, to get them and the system to do things differently. Of course prison is no place for women. And what I've tried to do is to work um, as a charity, as a, a voluntary organisation, to stop women coming into the whole toxic system of the criminal justice system, from prosecution, from being sentenced to community sentences, and, of course, in the end, to prison. The whole criminal justice system is no place for women. Now, what I concentrated on was trying to stem the flow, because if you... I don't want to make prisons a better place. I want to close them down. So I stem the flow of women through the system. We looked particularly at the arrest of women... So some, in England and Wales, some 90,000 women were arrested uh, by police forces around the country last year. And about half of them, just under half of them, there was no further action. So our question was, why were these women being arrested in the first place? And once you've been arrested, we know that you start to go through the system more often, you become known to the police, it's, it's very toxic. What I managed to secure was anonymized data from five police forces on about 600 women who'd been arrested. And it was fascinating. You could tell which police officer arrested them, what it was for, what happened to them, how long they were in the cells. Absolutely fascinating. And what we found was that whilst there was a lot of talk about, and people keep repeating this, it becomes a sort of a, a cliche, oh, well, people um, who committed non-violent offences shouldn't go to prison. Well, actually, a lot of women were being arrested for what looked like offences of violence. But what was happening was that they were defending themselves against violence, either by a partner and sometimes by the police. And quite often that then once it was investigated, would result in no further action. So they've gone through the trauma of an arrest, being held in a police station, and their fingerprints taken, maybe sitting in a cell, maybe overnight, and uh, yet nothing first, further was done because it wasn't required, and often it was recognised they were the victim. One force, we found, arrested 17 women in one day, 13 of whom led to no further action, and one involved a teenage girl who was allegedly arrested for smashing crockery in her home. Her mum had caused, you know, it was a, a family conflict. And that's quite often the story that you get. Women in distress, in stressful situations. Um, one woman we found was stopped by the police as they recognised her as a missing person. And there were concerns for her welfare. So during the arrest a woman clearly under stress, she kicked the police officer and was arrested for kicking a police officer. And she was, again, arrested for no further action. So it's actually the system which is criminalising women unnecessarily. There are still far too many women going into the system, getting prosecuted, getting sentenced, um, and increasing the sentences for assaulting uh, emergency workers, which, of course, has happened recently, will, I mean, nobody wants to assault a, a, an emergency worker, of course not, but increasing the sentences is sucking women into the system unnecessarily because quite often the kind of assault you're talking about is, is not serious. Um, it may be upsetting, but it's not a serious assault and it's usually a sign of distress and stress. Racism is a significant factor, of course. Black women are, mu are more than twice as likely to be arrested arrested, prosecuted, and sentenced. So I just want to say a little bit about who these women are who are ending up going through the system. Each year, about 5,000 women are sent to prison, either on remand or on, on sentence. 
that's through the whole year. And because there's, there's, that's quite a good throughput because a lot of women will go in for quite a short time. So 2,800 remanded, but the majority of those women who go into prison on remand will not get a prison sentence. The majority. And yet they get no compensation, they may lose their house, they may uh, lose their children. It's very traumatic. 1,500 uh, women who did get a conviction um, got less than six months in prison. So they're going, they're going uh, as a sentence, very, a very short sentence, and some just a few weeks. Only two women last year got a sentence over 10 years. Two women. And yet that's uh, 10 or 20 times more uh, for men. So women are not committing serious, violent, and dangerous offences. It's extremely rare for that to happen. Um, as Charlie said in her introduction, it's mostly for theft, uh, fraud, and that sort of thing. Whilst in prison, women suffer. Uh, they carry out a quarter of the self-injury rates, incidents. And I always call it self-injury. I've been dealing with this for a long time, suicide and self-injury in prison. And it's self-injury. It's different to self-harm. Quite a lot of us self-harm. I used to smoke for a lot of time. That's a form of self-harm. Um, but it's uh, 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 overeating. You know, there's there's a, a spectrum of self-harm that women do in prison as well. Um, but self-injury is a very deliberate act of, of cutting or, or ligaturing or really hurting, physically hurting yourself. Um, but there are, women are still a very small percentage of the population, and yet they're carrying out a, a quarter of the self-injury stati uh, statistics. Responses in prison to self-injury are often inadequate, just f in form-filling. During the pandemic, women particularly suffered, not able to have their children see them or visit or touch them. All women's prisons are today still under severe restrictions, whereas some of the men have moved to the highest level of easing restrictions. And prisons tell lies about what they're doing. One prison claimed that they got 80% of their women into accommodation on release. But when the chief inspector asked about it in more detail, what they found was the prison had managed to get the women a hostel place on release for two nights. That counted as accommodation. The Howard League has been um, overseeing uh, the all-party group on, on women in the penal system, supporting it. And yesterday, the chief inspector of prisons gave evidence to the, uh, the APPG. He said things like he found one prison where women, 20 women, had to share two toilets. Prison conditions are really grim for women. The other issue that, we're, that I've been particularly concerned about is that, uh, as you may well know, police cells are no longer used as a place of safety for men or women, but prison cells are. Um, so women in, in acute distress are being sent to prison as a place of safety. And in fact, um, Charlie talked about the young girls being sent to uh, male prisons. I, I tried to find out when was the last time um, a, a female was put in a male prison. And I think it goes back more than 100 years or 200 years. And yet they're putting children, girl children, in boys' prisons and one of them was there as a place of safety, apparently, on remand. She's not there anymore. We helped to get her out. Um, now, I've been trying to stop the whole place of safety. Prison is not a safe place for women. If they're in extreme mental distress, suicidal, or really hurting... Um, it's not a safe place. And I've tried very hard to, to get this stopped, to get the law changed. I've got a promise from the, the MOJ and Department of Health that they, they, as part of the process of a review, they will include it in legislation, forthcoming legislation on mental health. So that's something, but, you know, i wait to see. Um, my call is to abolish prisons for women. There may be a handful, literally one handful, of women who've committed offences so dangerous 
and are so violent and have committed such serious violence that they should be held in some kind of custody, but it should look completely different. And I really would say it would be one or two handfuls, uh, not the, the, the uh, several thousand who are there at the moment. Women's sex-based services in the community provide support to women who, could, who would otherwise be in prison. They work, they're lovely. They grew out of my second wave feminism. All these lovely women's centers around the country and they're doing fantastic work. They're all different because you know, we're very good at being different. Um, there are about 50 of them around the country and they provide a wrap around, literally a hug for women. They work, they keep women out of conflict, they help them get um, housing, they help them get away from abusive men, they help with debt, they help with drugs and violence, childcare, education, training, they help with life. Whatever it is you need, they will wrap around and give it to you. And that's the kind of thing that should help with, with, uh, with women. The government plans to build 500 more prison places for women. We're doing our best and a number of other organisations are campaigning to stop that happening. I would much prefer to see that money, the capital money, because once you build prison places, they're there for 100 years. Um, that capital money and that revenue money put into community support for women by women and let's, uh, let's close the prisons. Now, I want to abuse my position slightly by ending on something slightly different, because this is the last speech I'm going to give for, for, for well, maybe forever, who knows? Um, so I'm going to end with a reading the wonderful, the amazing Maya Angelou, a short bit of a poem of hers that um, is the, the, last, the last stanza. So she says... Now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say, it's the click of my heels, it's the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need for my care, because I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me and you. Thank you. Thank you.